Well, I wanted to touch on some things, a couple of things. The the uh, I remember you t- talking about at one of the seminars, yeah, the caveman kung fu, and the more I started to realize that that is a hundred percent true, and I I I would I went back into San Francisco PD when I was on the streets, and I just remember thinking I'm a dumb caveman. I try to pretend like I'm not scared. I'm fucking scared, and I the more I embraced that I'm just, I'm on I'm just a uh, a, maybe a better a tactical caveman. Maybe I'm, I'm a little bit more trained than the average, but I'm a dumb caveman. And the more I embrace that, I found myself reacting better and 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 spontaneously doing spear. I remember a guy, the one one of the years I was like after 2014, I went to another training. It was in Emeryville, and I came back. And after I speared this guy, I just started spearing everybody. And I don't know. <laughs> I, and and it just it honestly just kept happening. I'm like, this is crazy. My friend. We went and we we came in. We hit a door. Came into this guy's house. It was a drug bust. The guy sees us. He's in. Well, we knock on the door first. So he 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 knew. So he goes to the bathroom to flush down the drugs. Right. So we, we finally we oh, wait, we all right, we're gonna open the door. So we open the door. Door opens. He's there in this small apartment in the door, flushing down drugs. He goes like this, sees us, and I, we're not then. We go to cognitive. Hey, you know, drop the drug. Whatever you're doing, drop because we haven't cleared the house. So, I don't know what what happened to me. I just I jet towards him, and I, you actually teach this. I actually did it wrong technically. Is you can actually spear people with your gun sure, in sure. hand. I actually ended up retracting the gun and went with the no, left that, hand that's... spear. The guy doesn't expect it. I didn't know. I didn't even. I didn't plan this. It just went for it, and I end up hitting the guy. He's so surprised. He goes flying into the bathtub. Afterwards, we handcuff uh, the guy, and my buddy looks up. He goes, "Did you just spear that guy?" I go, "Yeah, I think so." He's like, "That was awesome." Yeah. And I had another one um, in a in a riot. We were in a riot. We get overtaken. This guy, same thing. All of a sudden, I hear a noise. You talk about this. The pre contact cues. We talk about it in law enforcement, but not the way you do. Like, yeah, this guy's probably gonna attack you, but we don't talk about it there's a different level of depth that you go into. And uh, anyways, I hear this grunting sound. Ugh! So I turn around and it's chaos. It's, it's, a, it's like they're coming after us. They're hitting us with signs and all this craziness. Um, they're trying to lynch prisoners at this time. And so I turn around and I'm just caught off. Guy. He's just, he just goes to charge me. I don't think twice, but somehow what I found fascinating because I w- was getting more and more, the spear was just coming mm. is that, I didn't go back. I actually went forward mm. and I that I was really pleased by that and I nailed this guy and he 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 actually sees it. I kind of telegraphed it. So he braced himself a little harder, but it was enough to at least keep him out bay and then I was able the bridge to the next move then we were able to do something with sure. him. Sure. So well the, well the reason the reason it started is first of all just as a reframe not a dumb caveman, a smart caveman and, and really what the metaphor is there is I'm I'm using a DNA level survival reflex that was around that kept cavemen alive. So in the original thought piece for that was, uh, Tony, I want to say something though. Yeah. I, I have a black belt in Kaju Kembo. When you get a black belt and I'm sure it's all ego based. You feel like, you know, uh, like I'm a black belt. I can, I can fight people. I can do this many years. I got that when I was 24, 20, 25. So I had it for a while. Now, not into my mid thirties. Now I'm fighting the streets of San Francisco, and I'm using spear. I'm using spear only. Like that's right. it. I felt more confident knowing because I had mentally in my mind. Well, you talk about it too, is demystifying the fight. And I think in my mind, I'm like, there's only so many ways this guy can attack me. Mm-hmm. If I use the spear. I had a new level of confidence, more confidence than I had having a black belt. And there's no disrespect. My instructor yeah. knows me. Like I love Kaju Kembo. I love the art, but it's just different. You know but, what I mean? But this is, this is, I mean, it's wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. This is the thing that, that again, what I say to all martial artists, like we've got um, about 140 affiliates around the world. We lost a, a bunch during COVID. Uh, but all of them are jujitsu, Krav, boxing, Thai boxing, people go like, I've got the toolbox and I use this, this, uh, you know, carpenter versus an architect metaphor 
where I go like, you, you're, you got your tools. Come here. Hey, could you fix my door? Can you do that? But I go, listen, I want to I wanna put an extension on the house here. Can you do that? And you go, well, you really need an architect. And I use the metaphor of to understand the timeline of violence and how to design your personal safety or your organizations. We do, you know, like like stuff where we help uh, uh, like, like, a, like a threat assessment, but for your arsenal, how you, you make, you know, use of force decisions. Yeah. Um, I'm a martial artist. I do like I've been a martial artist since I'm seven years old. If you include wrestling, now that's when I started wrestling. So thank you to the Gracies and the UFC to to expose how valuable like grappling was. But a lot of people think I'm I diss or dismiss other martial arts. I don't. I've just I'm obsessed with making sure that people don't confuse uh, street violence with martial arts there's value in the martial arts in the way that i just took you to a hardware store and i bought you a toolbox and i teach you how to hammer and i teach you how to screw and i teach you how to friggin sand shit but you don't know how to build anything and you you need to wait for something to break to fix it because you don't understand stress and angles and this and that right and so it, it's not a, it's not a great metaphor but people who train with us are understand the blueprint they understand the architecture of violence so they understand where a tool or a solution or more importantly you know they go if i do this i don't get here i'm safer sometimes i joke with people i say uh you know we're not gonna teach you how to fight we're gonna teach you how to not fight because you really don't want to yeah. at the end of the day with with people who are in public safety the the fight comes to you whether you want it or not, because yep. because you're moving towards the danger, uh, you would then want to. What is a system that is the easiest to learn, the most sustainable, the the least prone to injury, both wear and tear on my body, and also, as goofy as this sound, what is the safest thing I can do to a threat? Because there's a, a duty of care, there's an obligation that force should parallel danger. Yeah. Can't just do whatever we want. So it's it's super interesting. But I, there was there was something I, I went down a little rabbit hole there, but there's something that, that you said, hey, as a Kedja Kempo black belt, you find yourself doing the spear, spear, spear. We just had uh, I guess I can mention it, but the Australian Federal Police and also uh, Canada Corrections. We had guys go through our program. Both organizations called me after their courses, different courses. I might be confusing the number, but one said they eliminated 17 moves and another eliminated 14 moves. And they reclaimed three days of training during their during their recruit class. Well, imagine doing three extra days of scenario driven uh, intelligent reps. When they say we, we dropped you know, a dozen moves, what they're talking about is they found, I always make the joke like the spear is the Swiss army knife of self-defense because I can don't move. I can be standing here like this and I could say, sir, blah, 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 blah. And now what I can do is I can reach down and grab you and I'm using outside 90 to turn this into like a, a, a you know, a, an arm bar. But let's say as I grab you, you go to tackle me and I jam you. Now I'm using that spear to jam, and I can transition off to this side. Or let's say as I've gone to move in on you, or I'm here like this, you go to throw a sucker punch, right? And the hand will come up. And now you go to tackle me, and my hand will come down. And of course, I could be hitting and dropping mm -hmm. elbows and doing knees and stuff like that. But in the initial moment, so I just, so now I said, well, you know, what if I'm over here and you grab my gun? Right, and there's there's the forearm blast down here, slam, and I'm knocking you back. It's just airbags deploying, and so it's like so. If I say, well, for a gun grab you can do this, for a headbutt you can do this, for a left hook do this, for a right hook you do this, for a tackle you do this, if you know, and suddenly they found oh wall search half spear. I don't I don't want to keep this law enforcement because I'm sure you have yeah. a, a wide yeah. demographic, but it was just this idea that if I'm talking like this. And I could be, you know, we've got multiple nonviolent postures. And we tell people that 
if the the full spear of pushing away danger fingers played outside 90 where i've got the greatest muscle contraction because of the the instinctive recruitment if i whip something at you you don't go oh shit your hands never your elbows never lock out so if you look at all those pictures we use in the classes of like shit going into the stands for an untrained person you always see the arm is slightly bent and the fingers are splayed if they're not holding things yep the body knows that this is the strongest position. So when we do it on purpose, and that comes back to we practice off balance on purpose, and then what starts to happen, you realize, oh, shit, I can do this on the ground. I can do this stand-up. I can do this against multiple assailants. And why you started using it so much is because it's the only system that's connected to the, the fear the hard wiring of our fear response, the instinctive fear, the intuitive fear, where, okay, I'm afraid right now. What your body wants to do at an unconscious level, if I, if I, if I drop you and you're, un, and you're not unconscious and you're on the ground, what position do you immediately go into? Fetal. Fetal. Cover up. Your, your body, you don't, you, don't, you don't go like this and go, oh, <laughs> right, and protect your nuts. Even if a guy's kicking you, if two guys are kicking the shit out of you, the guy's still doing this. Yeah. The body, at a, in, in, in a semi-conscious, non-conscious, goes, get small, cover the head. This is hardwired. So I go to hit you, you, you cover your head. Um, and I don't, I, I mean, we're more popular than we've ever been, and we've done way more, but there's still massive pockets. And this is an interesting thing of, of resistance. I wanted to bring this up with you. The re but the resistance yeah. is weird, but it's because of it's because of a misunderstood element of dopamine and romance. Mm. What do I mean? Yeah. You do jujitsu. You fall in love with jujitsu. Every problem is solved by tapping a guy out. And I tell people this, I can kick you in the leg, but I can't really make contact because I go, Joel, if I kick you, I'll break your knee, so I'm going to pull it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to grab your throat but i'm not going to crush your trachea because then you'll die so a lot of the stuff in martial arts that drops people you can't practice properly even if we put on my high gear suit right we, we talk about go full speed but not full power that energy is going to go somewhere right i can headbutt you for real now i could drop an elbow but it's not going to be my hardest right and uh, so we always say, you know, our maxim for scenario-based training is training can hurt and should hurt, but it should never injure. So why is there resistance? If you practice jiu-jitsu for five, ten years, and every problem is solved by jiu-jitsu, or you practice taekwondo for ten years, and every problem is solved by taekwondo, or you box, and every problem is called, you're creating a romantic, you have a love affair with your art, right? Um, you probably heard a spear before your first class and your first reaction probably was, what's this shit? <laughs> Am I close? Well, e even, even when you talk about this, right. right? Being here, this to me seems goofy, right? Like even till today, like this is a goofy fighting stance, but I've also trained a lot in boxing. So I do feel comfortable like in this stance. It's, it's cognitive. You know, I'm like consciously coming up to the stands but to fight from here like that well, just seems so, so funny and, and right pin, so when i see that i'm like pin okay. that pin that and remind me to come back to that because yeah. i want to explain this this, this, is, this is a this is a fun thing for other martial artists and other systems to think about your car in this metaphor is your body you're in good shape i'm in good shape that's our car you're not that big, so you're a Prius. I'm a, I'm a, let's say, I'm a Ford Raptor. Okay, <laughs> just kidding. Uh, you're a Mustang, and uh, you know I'm a Charger. We're we're about the same size, but we're both like muscle cars. Yeah. The metaphor here is the car is our physique. We got torque, we got speed, we got power. Our brains are are driving. I know to do this, I can do a J tier, and I can fucking pull a donut, I can accelerate, I know when to hit the gas, brakes. That's our, our strategy and tactics, our driving. I go, hey, I'll race you to that coffee shop. Knowing routes and how to drive, 
a beat you there, you you know, if I beat you there, you buy, right? So that's that. So now we got the car, we got on the way there, we both get in a car accident because we're driving like fucking maniacs. But we don't cause the car accident other than we were speeding, but it's at a speed where if the airbag doesn't deploy, we both die. Do you want an airbag in your car? Oh yeah. Yeah. So this example is like I love jujitsu. I'm friends with some of the best jujitsu guys in the world. If I grapple with them, I'm now Tony Blauer, the pretzel. Like, I'm like, oh, fuck, okay, wow. Well, I didn't know my body bends like that, <laughs> right? Some of them go, hey, what would I do here to me? What would I think here? What if I had a gun here? What did I... And I did a, I did a, uh, a talk recently. There was a very, very famous jiu-jitsu guy that got murdered in a club in, in Brazil uh, recently. World-class legend. And he's not the only. There's, I, uh, there's a, a presentation I do, and it involves some very, very famous professional fighters who, if I got in the ring with them or on the mat with them, would destroy me. All I could hope to do without going outside the rules is how long can I survive? It's not even about tactics. Like, I don't, they're just at different levels. Yeah. And they're all dead now because they tried to be courageous bystanders or intercede in a violent encounter and the sociopath produced a gun or a knife and got to them before they could get to their system what am i talking about it's just you you can't just insert this move here right if we're playing contact chess right you know the game chess mm -hmm. right and you know, you go, huh, and I punch you right there, right? Like if it's contact chess, you forgot, like Bruce Lee said, never take your eyes off your opponent, right? You understand, like it's not just about this, the technique. There's like, there's danger, there's fear here. There's a penalty if something happens. So what am I getting at in this metaphor? And, and hopefully I didn't, I didn't lose anybody with this. Is our, our training, our physique, our body is the car. Our mind is our nav system. Our fuel is fear. Let's go. <sighs> okay, let's. Because if you can be overwhelmed with fear, or you go, how do I use this? Mike Tyson figured out how to use his fear. George St. Pierre recently t interviewed saying, scariest day of my life is. Have you seen that, that little talk with him? I'll, I'll send you a link if you haven't seen it. It's no, great. Yeah, send it to me. Where he goes, I've heard you talk about this. Yeah, one. where he goes, he goes, like, Every, every day I fought was the day I was the most scared. He makes a joke. He says, there was one fight I wasn't scared, Matt Sarah, and he knocked me out. Maybe I should have been afraid, right? Yeah. And he goes, I'm not afraid to talk about my fear. But a lot of people in a type A personality, law enforcement, military, fighters, they're like, fuck fear. And you know we have an acronym for fuck fear. I probably yeah. should have worn that shirt. Yeah. But fuck fear, face it, understand it, control it, and know it. But I got, I got too many stories going here. If you're training in another martial art you create a romantic relationship with that art you unconsciously think of ways your art solves problems so for example if you're a grappler and i go guy goes to strong arm rob you at an atm machine you just took some money out so what are for strong arm for our audience it means he doesn't have a weapon right he's going to just his size and threat of violence can intimidate you yep if you're a jiu-jitsu guy are you going to consider running in general? Like if you go to, I go, what would you do here, jiu-jitsu guy? Mm -hmm. You go, I'm going to double leg the guy. I'm going to fucking mount him. Maybe I'll smack him a couple times. I'll turn over. I'll choke him out. Would the jiu-jitsu guy consider uh, verbal de-escalation because force parallels danger and he wants a moral, ethical, legal solution? Well, chances are he's never even heard that language, so he's not going to think about it. In other words, folks, I'm talking about augmenting your arsenal not stopping that yeah. but let's say it's two or three guys hey man better chance of like strong arm with force multipliers yep should i be pulling guard now should i take one guy down and the other two guys are going to go hey fair fight let's let them alone or is he going to kick you in the face the question here is this will the taekwondo guy when faced with the same problem, think about running and verbal de-escalation? Or is he thinking about kicking because Taekwondo is predominantly... In other words, why is he thinking about kicking? It's not because he doesn't 
he can't think of other stuff. It's because his neural patterns are all trained to solve his problems with his art. Yeah. And so we have a drill called live action response where we go to a lapel grab. I want only verbal tactics to de-escalation, lapel grab. I want uh, nonviolent posture and some sort of grappling control. Then it, we do lapel grab. Now it's striking, then lapel grab. Now it's get to technology, right? And so what we do is we make people cycle through all force option continuums from a single attack. Counterintuitive, right? So if you lapel grab me, and I go, you two hand lapel grab. I might be here, man. I don't want trouble taking you. No, 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 no. We do that all the way to how would I jam you in here, get my gun out and contact shoot you. Mm -hmm. Don't overthink and jump ahead, those of you who are listening. Force must parallel danger, right? So when I make people do that, and no one's ever taught self defense like that. It's always, it's, they don't use this language, but it's always an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. If he grabs you, you're going to do some sort of jujitsu Aikido move. But if he pulls a gun, then you can pull your gun. Mm -hmm. What if I jump across the room here, grab your brother, and I start killing him with my fists, and then I go, you're next. Are you going to go, well, I got a gun on him. He just killed my brother. But this is, I got to go striking with him because it's, but that's the way we teach use of force, right? Yep. So how do you create a Socratic experience, meaning how does a student go, what should I do here? And that's our true safety model. What's the safest thing I could do right now? Given the threat, their ability, their intention, all the, all the legal elements that a lot of people don't know. How, but how do we make that decision? Instincts, intuition, intelligence. So the the just, just to, to kind of wrap up the last thought of why there's resistance is people don't realize that we've studied violence for and aggression for 40 years we put together everything is scenario driven what's going to emotionally psychologically what are you thinking in this scenario because if you don't clear the fear part you can't make a rational decision and you maybe can't communicate to your body because the mind navigates the body what is the thing i should do here so I'm here like this, you throw a slow haymaker, and I go, shit, and I push away danger. But all of my training is, oh, I'm going to double leg, mm -hmm. take this guy down here. But there's six guys behind you getting out of their car, and what I should have done was fucking turn this into Nike dough as I pushed you, broke contact, got out that, you know, got off the street into that crowded restaurant, and now I've got security, and, and the mob is there that I can maybe recruit. Yeah. So we would actually, in, in our scenario training, I go, guys, when this erupts, deploy the airbag and fucking run. Deploy the, <coughs> excuse me, deploy the airbag, get one shot in, primal gross motor, and run. And I've had people in seminars, and I tell this story often, I still fr friends to this day, it was 1988. I said to this, the, the group, I said, the fight's going to happen down here. This is a, a 40 yard, or, or sorry, a 40 foot sprint to where our juice bar was in my original school. If you get there, that's safe haven. That's the police. That's the hospital. That's a bar. That's security. I don't want entanglement. I want breaking contact. And this guy, his name's Larry, he put up his hand. I go, yes, Larry, question. He goes, yeah, with all due respect, Mr. Blauer, we came here to learn how to fight. I think we all know how to run. And I said, Larry, the fact that you don't even want to practice this tells me your ego or pride might keep you in a fight longer than you should be. Mm. So this is what I mean by our dopamine, meaning the, the, the neurochemical of I like doing this, right? You've grappled. Yeah, I did jujitsu for right? off and on four years, yeah. How fun is it when somebody it's, taps? It's fun. It's the best. Yeah. But it's better than anything else. Why? Because if we're boxing... And depending on your school of boxing, you're not trying to knock each other out all the time because you know you're going to get TBI. It's bad for you. So we, we, we control that shit. We might go hard to the body. And there's dopamine there because it's like if I hit you with a body shot and I hear you go, yeah. and you go, hold on a second. Right. <laughs> like I'm, like I'm, I'm going, are you okay, man? But inside I'm going, yeah, yep. right? You like it. Um, so certain combat sports, you can get that. But there's something when i would grapple making someone tap out there was there was something 
even well, I'll call it even sexual. I don't mean in a, <laughs> but it was like, like, would I rather tap somebody out or have sex tonight? That's what I meant. Like, it was uh, yeah. this is getting weird, it's but you know, it, it's, it's it is it's, it's very it is it's so very fun. satisfying. Yeah. Um. So I love jujitsu and grappling, and there's an amazing school I used to train off and on with my schedule, and and um. But I know that when you do something a lot, and this is the last thing you'll appreciate this. Some people won't understand this because they weren't cops or in public safety when you are when your unconscious mind is going this guy gets near me i'm gonna shut i'm gonna sidekick his kneecap this guy moves near me i'm gonna hit him with an uppercut like like the boxer thinks this the tie boxer thinks this the jiu-jitsu guy thinks this that visual of your favorite move solving the problem compromises your situational awareness your situational awareness right you have a, a maximum no awareness no chance if you if it doesn't even occur to you to run or to distract with language or to use language as a distraction or nonviolent postures and you're okay if he gets closer i can kick him here okay when he moves here i'll just oh, hit him here even when you you're talking about let's do this the um uh you said even to this day you don't like the spear stance. Being like this, yeah. Right? Yep. Being like this is the problem. It's transitory. Mm. So I'm going to jump up off my chair. What I want you to do is when I jump up off my chair, I want you to also stand up really quickly and get in a boxing stance. Okay? okay? Um, for the point of illustration so we don't knock off e equipment, do you care if I'm left side or right side forward? When I, when I step up. Um, go Too late. So I'm on you, right? <laughs> so I'm on you. Like you didn't do fucking shit, right? Now the only chance you would have had, right? The only chance you would have had if I, if I come at you here is not to do that, but to do this. Yeah. So you had to, as a tactical about. athlete, go, when Tony moves, do this. But you don't know when I'm going to move. Yeah. So if I'm here like this and you jump at me, this is the fastest thing I could do. Why? Call up a paramedic friend of yours and tell them where is there always trauma in a car accident when somebody doesn't have a seatbelt on? And where is it? You know the answer. Always hands and forearms. Yep. Which means, think about this. Faster than your head can hit a fucking windshield, your hands get up in the way. There's nothing faster. And yep. you don't think. You're not in slow motion going, oh, put your hands up. Like, it, it bypassed. We had a, a, a woman... In a seminar I was doing down in Atlanta years ago, and you know the, the storms they have down in, in that area, sudden out of nowhere, I get a text message in the morning. I may be late. I was in a bad car accident last night. I totaled the car. It was a rental. Fortunately, we had insurance. I'm okay, but I'm gonna be. I'm probably going to be late because we don't have a car, and i got to figure out how to get there. I was like, holy shit. Okay, good. Glad you're safe. I start doing my talk, <clears throat> and in the beginning, I start talking about biological airbag, and I talk about this windshield, you know, this whole metaphor I just did, and all of a sudden, while I'm in the middle of going, and think about this, ask any, do you have any firefighters or EMS that works, you know, accidents? Yes, yes, am I right? Yes. And then all of a sudden, I hear, <gasps> like, this gasping, and I see this woman turn like this, and her arm is bright red. And I said, are you okay? And she goes, I'm the one that texted you. I didn't tell you, but we we're driving. Sudden storm. I mean, the windshield wipers couldn't catch up. We hit water, skidded. We hit a tree. Both airbags deployed in the car. And look at this. She had like a carpet burn on her forearm from when the airbag hit her. How's that possible? Yeah. Because she was like this when she thought she, and I said to her in front of the class, and it was pretty funny. I said, oh my God, like, holy shit. I said, you didn't happen to videotape the accident, right? You weren't like on your phone, like, you know, filming. Because if I had a videotape of the start of Flinch beating the airbag deploying, like that'd be really good for business, right? And everyone kind of, kind of giggled. But think about how fast does this have to be? Yeah. So somebody... If 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 you're tracking me and I go, you know, fuck you, man, and I take off my scarf, 
and I start wrapping my hand, you can go, here we go. And you could go, when he steps in, I'm going to fire an uppercut or I'm going to punch him in the nuts. So you can do that and hopefully you're right and hopefully you're on time. But if you're surprised, your body already starts the flinch. Why not convert that into something protective or tactical? And that's the whole hypothesis. And, and so any, and this is why like all the affiliates that we have are experienced martial artists from other system we realize we don't teach neurobiology we don't teach fear management in a in like the internal like self-talk yeah uh i've had some people go like do you teach self fear management they go well it's scary to spar so yes i go well that's not the same thing right and and of course and you know this we've been doing scenarios since 1980 i mean we reinvented like like to me uh uh we call it the three R's, realistic, relevant, rigorous scenarios, so that you're improving your tactical fitness, but you're improving your pre-contact cue, fear management awareness. Because so a lot of people, when they do scenario training, they're really just sparring with equipment on. They're not replicating yep. a scenario. Yep. And you need to actually look at a video and go, and we, use, we always use real videos so that nobody could go, uh, it sounds like they're making that up. You look at it and yeah. you go, that happened. I would never be put in that position. Right. Yeah. Or, or I'd never be. And yeah. people say that. They go, I would never do that. I go, well, that's not the point. The point is if it just comes back to something you said about not thinking about it. We have a, like a, a little maxim. You go, if you don't think to do it in training, what makes you think you'll think to do it in the street? And so the idea, and that ties into that live action response uh, uh, training where um, and we, we – we do this in class where, you know, with training weapons, lapel grab, and it's half spear, drive the person backwards, get your weapon out, offline shooting or contact shooting. And I've done this in a class where I don't explain the drill. And I start with that. So imagine this, imagine you're in a cop class and we're like this, I wish I had a weapon on me, but I don't grab, lapel grab, both hands, pull me in. And I go, whoa. And then I go like this. I jam you across here and I pull the weapon out and, and come out here and do this. And I go, and, and people like, I demo it and, and every cop in the class is like, anyone have any questions? What the fuck are you doing? You can't, they say you can't do that because they don't understand all of their training was the same as your cop saying, why didn't you go to the baton? Because we're taught in block-based training, not brain-based training. We're yep. taught blocks of instruction instead of brain-based, which is, why am I doing this? What's going on here? It's a big picture. So <clears throat> would you, you know, what's the counter to headlock? Counter to the headlock? Yeah. Uh, quick, quick, quick. C-clamp, grab C -clamp. the neck, release pressure from right. the neck, create so, space, groin strike. So yeah. so if, if I had, can you pass me the gun there? Thanks, man. So, cert pistol, right? So, we, like, I'll do things like this. I don't have a holster on me. This is my Air Force holster, right? So, come stand here, please. You know, you get me in a headlock, and, and this might be the counter here where I go here, bang, 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 right? Mm -hmm. And we'll practice that, and you go, it will, we'll show that in, in a class. We'll go, who practices drawing your weapon and shooting somebody in the foot or in the leg from a headlock? You ever done that? No. But if you were a soldier downrange and you got jumped from behind in a cave in some like remote area and you know that if you got captured, you're going to get decapitated, should you be grappling with the guy or should you immediately transition your pistol? Yeah, go to the pistol. Right? So, so we start off like brain-based training is what's your scenario? If somebody grabbed you and they're dragging you to a secondary crime scene, right? And you know where, where this is going. Why would you immediately default to the C-clamp? Turn your head. But we also, so I need everyone to understand is we also do like a grappling counter. Because if you were in a jiu-jitsu tournament this weekend, you shouldn't be wearing your gun right yeah so it's understanding what is my scenario and then going i understand the scenario and i understand force must parallel danger so in this scenario here i do jujitsu in this scenario here like 
Like we have a move in, in the, uh, you know, uh, headlock, get me in a headlock, where the guy's in the headlock, you pin the hand, this hand comes up into the eyes, that smacks the nuts. When he doubles over, we come up under the chin, easier. Mm-hmm. I'm so glad that you're fucking short. It's easier to do. But there's things we do are smack the head, gouge the eyes, because the guy's got both his blocking and striking tools. Yep. But I wouldn't do that in a jiu-jitsu tournament. Right. I would do that in a really violent street encounter. So we do all of it, but what we're trying to get people to be is conscientious. Why am I doing stuff? It's the neurobiology that I think that is really fascinating. But I understand what you're saying about the whole dopamine thing and the, the romanticizing. But I'm, I still think it's a pro- the more I've dived into the spear system, like I, I don't honestly like everybody needs to know it like that's where i'm at and i and i do you ever think about like one day you'll be gone and like well i feel like a hundred years from now like <laughs> it'll be one of those things where I, when will people get it that's kind of what I, I i want and and i and i feel like you've been teaching for over 40 years and i still feel like yeah but people still don't get it they don't understand like the beauty and what you're talking about and so do you ever think about that or do you like how do we isn't it like in japan aren't they like don't aren't they like forced to learn like judo or something it's, it's like taught right. in school that's kind of how i think spear should right. be taught kendo judo. yeah i listen i agree it's so you know one of the one of the most important things one of the biggest things that um uh I, i'm spending a lot of time on now is our no fear program spelled k and or w i'm wearing the shirt spelled k and or w there's no such thing as no fear there's k and or w fear if i change my relationship with fear i can change my mind if i can change my mind i can change everything i do so i change my life um it, learning to manage fear doesn't mean fear ever goes away so you know i've been i'm you afraid know, like you said george st pierre the greatest one of the greatest fighters ever yeah Head like fear. you Muhammad like Ali, right? you 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 see him you see like you know, Mike Tyson used to cry and throw up before fights. If I walked, if you didn't know who he was by reputation or performance, and you walked into his changing room by accident, going, "Hey, uh, is this?" Uh, and you saw him going, "Whoa!" <laughs> like crying, you'd go, "Man, I feel so bad for that guy. He's about to go out there and become world champion or knock somebody out." That was how he ex- expelled and expressed the fear. But you know, his 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 boxing coach Customato was an amazing psychologist, right? Teaching people, yeah. you know, his fa- most famous line is the difference between the hero and the coward is what they do with their fear that they both feel it. So, um, you know, you asked, you asked a heavy question. More and more and more people get it. I I, I don't know. Because, I, I, Tony, I, I'm like, when I look at your what you've built, and this is not to stroke your ego. I, hopefully you know me. Like, I could care less. But... The way I just look at it, it's really like a metaphysical, like it's a higher level thinking and we're all playing on like the third dimension. We're all still arguing about like, is jujitsu better or is like boxing better? It's like, it's irrelevant. <laughs> like guys, like this is actually, like this is so, where we need to be thinking, right? It's a higher level, and, a, and, yeah, and higher I, level I, of consciousness. I, really. I, no, I appreciate that. But the, uh, and this goes back to the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? Self-actualization is at the top and, and survival is at the bottom. The essence of spear is the only one that, from a science point of view, addresses survival. So if I said to you as a boxer, hey, could you handle yourself in the street? You're like, yeah, well, I had 100 amateur fights. I've been in street fights. I've lit the guy up. I've been in street. I'm, I love boxing. I've broken both my hands, cracked my wrist, broken knuckles in street and on on elbows you know coming up or cup in an elbow with gloves that were too small and you know dislocating a thumb or whatever so i love that so the whole spear system doesn't take away my love of boxing yeah same for me and and the whole spear system doesn't take away my love of our rear naked choke or you know arm barring or, or taking or taking somebody down you know I, and and we show it, you know, it's in there. So spear becomes a bridge. The biggest thing for people who are like, ah, oh, spear, I, like, why do you want to flinch? You don't want to flinch. You will flinch if it's the right type of attack, and that's the danger. So deploy that, create space, and then transition to what you need to do. Uh, but the only question is you need to, and I'll give this example. 
I'm not going to mention names or or location because a some of the people may listen to your video, but but this place was uh, um, high level, like tier one. Final training exercise was a grab that long gun just because it's exciting for for your audience to see. The final you're 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 in um, high gear. Right, I come in. I come in here. It's a room clearing drill. We muzzle strike the guy here. He pretends he gets stunned over. I sling the weapon here, and I'm going to grab you in a prisoner handling situation. As I go to grab you, you go to tackle me. Boom! As the tackle happens, I'm supposed to half spear. This would be on a sling, so I would just let go. So I'm just going to put it down here. Everyone watching pretends. So I let go here. I would then drive out here, transition to my pistol, cover the room, and be able to engage you, right? Um, one of the guys in the scenario, and these are all like badasses, he goes like this, he comes in, everyone's in gear, he comes in the room, the role player's there, get on the ground, he's a no-shoot, whack, muzzle strikes the guy, the guy grabs his body, and now he goes here, the tackle comes in, when he gets the tackle, he immediately goes here, He's dropped the gun, and now he's, he's going in for yep. trying to do a guillotine. He does the guillotine for a second, brings the guy up. The guy taps his leg. So he goes, oh, here. He then slides out, drives the guy away, pulls out his pistol. I see it, and I walk over, and I play. say, hey, man, you're in a CQB environment. You shouldn't do anything that ties up both your blocking and striking tools. This is dynamic. A guy who you thought was a no-shoot just attacked you. You got gear on, you fall to the ground, you can't cover other threats, get get to your equipment right away. He goes, I got it. He does the same thing again. He comes in, hits the guy, boom, nails the guy. As soon as the head dropped down, he goes guillotine, he indexes, transitions out, transitions out, and draws the weapon. He does that part beautifully, and the guillotine's lightning fast. He's, he's, he's world-class jujitsu. He does it again. And I'm like, man, and there's like 20 guys going. There's like, we got high gear everywhere. Every, everyone's doing it. But what's happening is this. The guys who didn't have a martial art background were doing this. Simulate it. Muzzle strike comes in. You go to tackle me. Whap! They're hitting here. Now, but I'm a right-hand shooter. Now it's whap! Nail the guy this way. Get him back. And then, and then come out. And it was just, just a patty cake with a primal gross motor movement. And everyone could pull it off. One guy was doing the guillotine. Sent one of my guys over. I go, I'm getting frustrated because he's look, look, he's slipping in the jujitsu on purpose. This is, an, this is an important story. And very true story. And uh, I go, hey, go tell him. And I see them talking. Usually when you see somebody in your class and you've taught who goes, I thought he'd be bigger or this again. They're like, you know, they got... They're sneering at you. They're kind of like, you can see them. This guy seemed open-minded. He's going, okay, got it. But he couldn't not do the guillotine. Hmm. Have you ever read the book, The Talent Code? Yes. And I, I want to actually talk about that okay. briefly. So, so if you talk about The Talent Code, you should know there's no muscle memory. It's neurons. It's neural patterns. It's signal speed. It's the myelin sheath. It's all of that weird neuroscience that we can't see. What I realized this, as I was getting frustrated and I was in the middle of the talent code and I just finished the chapter where I realized this guy, it wasn't that he didn't want to do the spear. It was that in a high stress situation, all of, all of the motor engrams, all of the, the neurons, everything he saw, when he saw mm -hmm. center gravity shift, he knew he was going to sprawl or guillotine because... The, the part of the drill started with a muzzle strike into a grab for prisoner handling. Because he was on him, when you went to tackle me, this made perfect sense yeah. to him because he was already wrapped. He was touching the neck. And it was a big, and I say this to everybody because a lot of people probably thought I was putting down jujitsu. What it was, my understanding of the neuroscience of practice, dopamine, romantic, neural patterns, when I put this individual in a CQB environment where the safest thing to do was to get this fucker off you and get to your pistol, his brain said, we've done spear for 20 reps, but we've done guillotine for 20 years. Yeah. 
and then it was making a choice. And so we have a maxim, and this is the thing I forgot that, that I couldn't remember where I was going before, and I just remembered it now. We have a maxim that's that's very misunderstood. Be careful what you practice. You might get really good at the wrong thing. Be careful what you practice. You might get really good at the wrong thing. And I say that, and people go, oh, is he saying my boxing's no good, my kung fu's no good? My, I go, no. When you practice something over and over again, you you predispose your body to try to bring that into a scenario where you should have run, but you went in. Or like all you know, like, and it, you know, we have, uh, uh, especially with all the, the, the shootings and violence lately, you know, a, a, a little meme we created is sometimes the safest thing you can do is fight as hard as you can. Mm. The ability for me to go, oh my God, I want to get out of here. But the safest thing I could do in this active shooter situation, my family's there, this person's down here, I could get out there, but holy fuck, this is scary. The safest thing I could do now is not turn my back on this threat, but charge this threat. Mm. That's a, a fear management problem first. It's not a, guy, should I, you know, how should I run to the bad guy? Should I use the pose method? You know, should I get in a two-point stance, Right. And this is, comes back to how did caveman fight. Just fucking go. It's primal gross motor. Manage the fear and charge the threat. Um, so that whole thing of, of be careful what you practice. You might get really good at the wrong thing. I'm talking about neuroscience there. Not I'm not talking about like, you know, oh, why aren't you doing the spear? I don't give a fuck. Yeah. The spear, in it, at its at it, the most important part of the spear, and some would argue this, but the most important part of the spear is understanding the biological airbag connection. But the airbag doesn't make sense if you can't talk about pre-contact cues and the difference between imagined fear and instinctive fear. So suddenly you got to get into the neural circuitry of fear and understand how that works. And that doesn't make sense if you don't understand the neurobiology. If you don't understand that, that if you're in line at, at, at a coffee shop and I walk up behind you and I take a little pin and I poke you, you'll go, oh, fuck, what the fuck was that? Like, like you don't go, eh, as pin prick, it's probably a practical joke, I won't move. Like, you just, you're, you're, your body's nervous is a response. So you got to understand the neurobiology and then you got to understand what, what does your body do at a kinesthetic level and the kinematics of startle flinch. So it's not just like, oh, uh, yeah, I do finger splay too. And I'll, we have a, a bunch of arts that have similar movements, and they go, oh, we do that. And I go, you're confusing just the shape of the hand with the entire system. Mm -hmm. The entire system is truly the science of self-defense. You know, like I, and my other shirt, the science of self-defense, where it's on that shirt there, um, where, it, you know, we're, we're talking about neuro, you, there, you need a baseline in neurobiology, you need a baseline of kinesiology and a baseline of psychology. When you understand how they work together, then you've got the foundation for the spear and, and you can go from there. Yeah. Amazing stuff. I want to wrap some things up, but um, it's funny because you, you talk about – you've I've been in some seminars and stuff and, and, and read a lot of your stuff, and you talk about Gavin DeBecker and the gift of fear and how everybody knew they were going to be. And I, I love that because – when I went to your Las Vegas seminar, man, I don't know what twenty seventeen, and I think so. I I was um, I was staying at an Airbnb nearby, and it was I didn't know I it was near it was near the place where we we're training. It was ghetto. It was in right. the hood in Las Vegas. I had no idea, and uh, I get dropped off, and I got dropped off like near the complex. I'm like, it's somewhere here, Mister Lift Driver. Just drop me off here. There were some hood people sitting in a car like in the complex and I made eye contact. I got out of the car, I made eye contact with them and I'm immediately, and they made eye contact with me and I'm like, I'm going to get fucking jumped. I'm going to get fucking jumped before I go to the, I mean, and I'm, I was, I was a cop at this time. Like I knew it was, I, like, I, right. I just felt it. It was you like this knew. fear took over and I'm like, but I remember I was watching videos preparing to come to the, to the conference. The, I think it was like a five day camp. And um, I remember you saying like, why are you like, you know, you're going to get attacked. Like, what are you trying to prove yourself that like you, you're like, you know, like you, you know, this is happening. Like, who are you trying to prove that, like, that you're not scared or something? And I remember that being in my brain. I'm like, Joel, what are you doing? Like, you're probably going to get jumped. Like, we don't know. Maybe they're, right. maybe they're just having fun, whatever. But, um, I remember, so I was like, I embraced it and I like, 
I actually, I think I ran with my suitcase or something. I'm like, well, look at an idiot. But I like kind of jog, kind of trotted off a little bit cool, trying to get to an area where like I knew people were going to be. Anyways, the situation never happened. But um, I'm only saying that story. And the gift of fear, you always say, and Gavin DeBecken says, like, and every victim knew before they were attacked that they yeah. were going to be a victim of a sexual assault or like they saw something. And so I want to just, because a lot of what your program, you talk about no fear. The last three years, we have been living in fear by the government and media and everybody. And maybe you could just kind of talk about, you have this beautiful framework too that you, that you outline, but really in the shirt and like you were saying, like now you've been doing more no fear than maybe like some of the training with all these, yeah. with the pandemic. You had to switch yourself. Your business was shut down. Your yeah. business is based on being in person and doing these trainings and, and it got and, shut down. And, and 97% of my business was law enforcement and public safety. They weren't allowed to train when things first happened. Then we went from everyone was deployed to, oh, we hate you. We're defunding you. So then you've got defund, no money, a bunch of woke political people saying, yeah, you're not doing any hands-on stuff. Then people quitting. So, yeah, we almost lost everything. It was kind of scary. No, fear has been weaponized in the worst way. I mean, it always has been, but we've never seen anything like this. Uh, you know, while the media always worked with the people who ran, you know, follow the money, uh, but it's never been, there used to be at least a couple of like sources where there were legit journalists willing to expose people. And now that's almost all completely disappeared. And even if you've got a couple of small journalists trying to share it, you know, as soon as they try to put it on Instagram or Facebook, it gets, it gets shut down. Yep. So it's horrible. It's awful. I'm sad you know, at the state of the world. I'm angry, I'm sad. Um, but but yeah, I mean, the why I'm doing so much on fear is because of a couple of things. One is you can't solve problems if you are the problem and you remain the problem when you're in the fear loop, whether it's financial, health, uh, violence, relationship. You stay in a bad relationship because you're in the fear loop. You don't ask somebody to marry you because you're in the fear loop. You stay in a shitty job because of the fear loop. You don't quit a job and become an entrepreneur because of the fear loop. You know, you went through that with, uh, and it wasn't again, you know, it wasn't like, like a split second decision. The fear loop, you know, and, and I always make this, it's not a joke, but for every confrontation in life, You've got time to meditate and deliberate. If I said to you, uh, you know, from the day you realized this wasn't going to work out as a police officer to when you were finally let go, that might have been a year and a half or whatever. What was it? I don't know. Uh, I mean, I've been off for a year and a half, but um, the, I, w I was let go. October 2021, and then officially fired six right. months later. But I wasn't getting money or anything. I was, I was. They but, suspended but, me. There. But what, I, but yeah. what I'm saying is like you're like, okay, I'm going to work, and then it was like a problem, and then, but oh yeah. And what I'm saying is like someone will go. Yeah, I think my relationship's over. I had a month, so just to let you know, they let me know you have a month to get this experimental product in your body. If you don't, you're fired. So I had a month yeah. to make that decision. Um, the, you know, so that's pretty fast timeline. A lot of things in life health finances relationships you know you you know you wake up one day and you go i got i got like we got no money uh, we got to close the business that didn't just happen overnight i mean it can with some crazy shit going especially going on these days but the um most stuff there's pre-contact use just like in violence mm -hmm. so the uh the fear management stuff and and it's probably not a surprise that i'm doing more of that but if there was no last three years, what what I realized in the last three years is that, and this is something that I realized in the 80s, but I didn't realize how potent it was. And you know that Cerebral Self-Defense, uh, that was my first audio tape that was released in 1993. In The things you were saying, on the, it's funny how you, you understood this at such a high level back then. The well, this, this is, yeah, like, so... So the first audit, the first videotape for Panther Productions, most of you won't know who that is, but if you're an OG martial artist, Panther Productions had the first VHS videotapes out in the 80s 
we were in 1986, they released our videotape. So 1986, our first videotape was Cerebral Self-Defense, The Mental Edge. And it was a lecture all on managing fear and understanding, you know, self-talk, external, how do I talk to you? What am I thinking to myself? How do I organize all that? So back in the 80s, I was on that. But that started when Mitch got dropped and my student got dropped. It was like, I... It is pointless for me to practice a move, a move that I think is cool and then try to figure out how to put it, insert it in a violent encounter when I haven't even considered what the violent encounter is. That became that hypothesis of what's the scenario. You know this from trading with us. I would ask questions. People go this, this, and I go, the, the first and only question you ask in any Blauer tactical course is what's the scenario? Because when you start from that, It'll, you'll get this cascade of information, and that's why we say the system is self-correcting. You know, because it's not like memorize, what would Tony do? What the fuck? I don't... It's, what do you know about this? What is the opponent? What is their intention? Bad guys the only one property, body, or life. Where are you? Who are you with? Blah, blah, blah. But I realize that with all of the, all of the um, principles and concepts and universal truths that we discovered, the missing element in all of that was the ability to manage fear in a timely fashion and the operative principle here of managing fear is this idea of of uh that a lot of people go well, hey i just did your 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 no fear program we have a digital one for people who can't train with us hey i just did your no fear program but i'm still afraid yeah it's fear management it's not fear elimination you can't entirely eliminate it if mike tyson couldn't if george st pierre couldn't and I know, like, you know, SEALs and military people retire. They go, yeah, man. A lot of Because a lot of people in the type A world don't like to talk about it because it's kind of like, well, is it cool to say that I was nervous or I was afraid? Um, there's one guy, and I got to get his name. I just listened to the podcast, but I forgot his name. It was a, kind of a weird French name. He's from Belgium. But he's one of the top base jumpers in the world. Red Bull athlete. Um, uh, and they're doing it like a... Um, they're doing a uh, like a documentary on them, and they're at some like crazy mountains in Europe, and they've got the crew and these other j jumpers with him, and he's up there at the top, and he's like he's already like like best in the world. They're like hundreds of thousands of dollars are going to the documentary, and he goes he goes, um, yeah, I'm not jumping today. And they're like, whoa, 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 we got the planes up. We got this up. We're like, the guys are ready. Come on, man. We've already like spent 50 grand to set up this shot. He goes, no, I don't feel right. They tried to peer pressure him. Come on, let's get the shot. No, stuck to his guns. Now, this is one of those things like, like your Vegas story. So the, I thought these guys were going to jump in, so I ran away, and then, then nothing happened. So maybe, well, maybe nothing happened because... Your instincts picked up the danger. Your intuition whispered in your ear. And then you said, well, I'm a cop. I've been in a fight. I can say a cop. I got a badge on me. I could fucking, maybe they don't give a shit. Maybe they'll all right? I'm, I'm telling right? Maybe, <laughs> maybe, right? Yeah. And you went, I'm just going to D1 this. I'm going to, my internal talk is going to get the fuck out of here quickly before they can formulate a plan and triangulate on me. Um. I share this story with the base jumper because here's what a lot of experts don't realize. Yes, you're a fucking expert. Yes, you've got the muscle memory. Oops, you've got the neural patterns. Yes, you've stress inoculated. You've done the fights. You've done the competition. You've done the stuff. But wait a minute. What is your intuition telling you right now? Should you be running or should you be fighting? And that's the biggest thing. And that is all part of fear management. If when I understand how to manage fear, I improve my self-awareness. When I improve my self-awareness, I improve my critical thinking. When I improve my self-awareness and critical thinking, situational awareness is much more relevant. It makes more sense. Mm -hmm. Your situational awareness picked up on the danger. But if you pretended it wasn't there because you didn't lean into your intuition and you just put blinders on or you went, I'm a cop, I'm a martial artist, right? maybe you don't show up the next day yeah. so it's very holistic what we're doing and uh and man i appreciate what you said i i i wish more people you know 
gave it a chance as opposed to look at a picture of it and went, why is he, you know, and I, many times I've said this, I'm in the spear stance, I'm in a spear stance, and, be, and I get this out, this question all the time. I go, can't a guy break your fingers? Can't he grab your hand and break your hand? He, yes, he can if you stay there like a statue. But the start of flinch happens like when Madison surprised me in the middle of the night and I went, duck, like, <laughs> like if that had been a fight, I'm already moving. I'm already, my thumb's in your eye. My palm strike. I'm on you. I'm grabbing you. I'm flinging you. I'm pushing you. So it's transitory. Yep. When, when you when you dropped the guy that was about to sucker punch you, like you didn't stay there. You were like non-violent posture. And it's like, hey, whack, and you moved. And as soon as it made contact, you transition. Yeah. So so you're not sparring like this. It's it's, yeah. a, it's a, But people, they see that, Joel, they see that position. They go, Oh, I would just double leg the guy, or I would kick the guy, right. or I would just parry his arm, and and you got to understand. I mean, we've worked with professional fighters, MMA fighters, boxers, jujitsu guys. The people that open their minds to it go, "Wow!" First off, selfishly, it makes them safer in the street, like for for real practical self defense. Yep. Are there are there applications, you know, in the um, uh, in an octagon, in a boxing ring, fuck yeah! And I've had guys u use it in both at the at the highest level too. Yeah, I remember this is back in 2011 when I got to meet you for the thing for the first time. At the uh, Frank Mir was a champion at the time, and yeah. you had worked in his camp, and and he had actually kind of used it to hold the guy off. I think uh, I yeah, his name Nogueira. Nogueira and it was like hitting. Yeah, him. Nogueira yeah. went in for a double leg, yeah. and Frank jammed him with the spear, and it was something we practiced with his role players with our high gear equipment. Because they were just sparring, and then he brought me in the last week of camp. And uh, when we do stuff, we identify the PIA, primary initiation attack. We go, we had film of Nogueira. He does this little, he does little jab, and then he shoots here. And then, you know, Frank jam with the half spear. And then under the half spear, it was kind of, it was kind of fascinating, is you go to tackle me, that, that the half spear hits here, and, and he was jammed out here. Tell me. Tell me when I throw the punch. If I go slam and I fire that uppercut underneath there, you wouldn't see that if I hit you in the yeah, face, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So when when that half spear hit, this was the counter we came up with. Pop underneath here. And it was that short, but it's it comes out of it comes out of like your and Frank's uh, southpaw, uh Noguer, I think is orthodox. You're you're standing oh yeah, or um I don't remember. It doesn't matter, but we're here like this. When the tackle happened, this this happened here. There was a, like a little tug of war here. And then the movement was this, wham, just a quick, short uppercut. And if you can't see it, it stuns you. I mean, it just, yeah. and, and Mir's a good striker. And obviously, both those guys are big and strong. But his back is so big, it was so funny. I got a picture of, of him and I in his hotel room after. Um, he's got ice on his legs and he's got the belt. And I said to him, I go, dude, I was really hoping that you would, and I couldn't see where my seats, I couldn't see any of this, you know, because it looks, because it looked like this, right? You, like, you yeah. can't, right? So I'm like, I'm like, I said, I'm very, you know, we'd become buddies. I said, I'm super proud of you. I'm so happy for you. A little sad that you didn't use the spear in the fight because that, you know, I really wanted, I wanted that to happen so you could, I'm making a joke so yeah. that you could say, I'd like to thank the spear. Yeah. Um, and he goes, what are you, what are you talking about? You, that was the move that set up the, the take. And, and Noguera had never been knocked out. And he said it came across. It was just that, that little short move. Um, and again, just to be clear, not taking any credit for the fight. I was there for like four days before in the last week. Did he use that? Did we isolate? And anyone could do that. And this is what we do in our how to watch a dashboard video part for our law enforcement public safety is we look at the attack and then we we do significant reps of that attack so that you're developing the pre-contact cue awareness and the primal gross motor protective and then complex motor skill transitions for that so you're not just sparring. Yeah, yeah. Amazing stuff, man. Um, I want to wrap things up. Thanks for being gracious with your time and no, no, letting me fine. hang out with you. Um, can you just tell everybody, like – whatever new your new things you're up to and just where they can connect with you, learn more about you and, and, and yeah. Yeah. So, uh, um, I think it's lifted a little bit, but I'm pretty shadow banned 
like a, like a lot of people yeah. teaching stuff. So, you know, but at Tony Blower, you know, on, on, you know, Twitter and Instagram and Facebook and stuff like that. I would tell you if you can link it in the, in the show notes, I'm sure my team got you the link. Yep. Uh, I, I wrote a, uh, um, a nine page ebook called making friends with fear. And, and, uh, I joke that it took me 40 years to write that. People go, why don't you write your book? Well, I am working on several books. But the, the Making Friends with Fear, they go, why is it only nine pages? I go, because if it was 10 pages, you wouldn't read it. Most people don't read. Yep. Read that because you might have a light bulb moment. We had a guy, uh, he's got a, 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 a podcast. I'm not going to mention his name out of respect for his privacy. He's got a, a, a podcast. He got my No Fear program. We have a 97-minute digital program of it for people who can't train one-on-one -on -one or get the seminars. And um, he said, he sent me a message. He said, I watched it five times. I made pages of notes. He said, I've never told anyone this, but I've had mild anxiety the last five years. And uh, since doing your program, like I think it's gone, is that possible? So I answered back, and I've got friends that are therapists, and and so I'm not, but I, so I'm not knocking that. But it was just an opportunity for the joke. I said, if I was your therapist, then no, it's not possible, because I got to pay off my second home and my boat. You know, I need to see you the rest of your life every week. You know, so he laughed. I go, dude, you don't know when the light switch is going to happen. You didn't like Spear when you first learned it. You're like, okay, that's another tool in the toolbox. And then one day you went, holy shit. And the reason that you started using it is because it is the natural expression of a human, not a dumb caveman, of a human in a highly stressed state. If you were highly stressed and I said needle, pin, needle, uh, sorry, needle thread, you're nervous thread it go you'd be like fuck right you know the the yep, whole joke yep, there yep. if you are highly stressed you know the pen is mightier than the sword maxim mm -hmm. this is a fun one folks you're highly stressed your adrenaline is going you're shaking you're you're somebody almost killed you through negligence and recklessness and they're fucking sitting on the sidelines going haha you fucking almost died you pissed your pants and you're like let me at him and we're like and your fucking adrenaline's going. And I go, Joel, write him a letter and explain to him why he was naughty. Dear, inconsiderate, right? Fuck, I can't write. I'm so nervous. Or, ta-da, here's a baseball bat. Go smash him. In a highly stressed state, do you have access to your complex motor skills, fine motor skills, or your primal gross motor? Primal, yeah. Right? Primal gross motor. And so the concept here is when I am in a state of fear that doesn't mean and i always tell people just that you can't be brave if you're if you're not afraid it's a wonderful thing you can't be brave if you're not afraid and we always want to be courageous and the primary ingredient of courage is fear and there's only one ingredient like if i ask you to do something that i'm scared of you know uh and you're not afraid of it then can we say that you use courage to do it yeah, right, yeah. You, you can't. I, I can't, yeah. You're not afraid, right? So it's it's a weird thing. It's so subtle. I mean, that's how I – mean, what I try to – we have a, a doctor who, who's an adjunct instructor of ours. He's a psychologist 20 years. When he discovered our approach to fear management, he brought it into his practice, and now one of his, his focuses is, is actually working with vets with PTSD. But all of his clients get exposed to our fear manager because he's like, there's nothing simpler. In fact, he said to me the first time when he finally had his light bulb moment, he goes, this is more effective than anything I've learned in 20 years of psychology. Well, and I said to him, I said, dude, that might be the greatest testimony I've ever heard, but you probably can't, I probably can't use it because, you know, he goes, no, no, you can fucking use it. So if you go to my Coach Blower No Fear website, it, his name is on there, Jeff Detesso. 20 years over, it's probably 24 years now. Um, but he uses this as the foundation because all of the other things that you're teaching people, if people can't wrap their head around, I have tools to manage fear. And the biggest light bulb moment is managing fear doesn't mean I'm not in danger. And managing fear doesn't mean I'm without fear. 
you know that meme danger the dangers uh how does it go is, is uh danger is real fear is a choice mm. have you seen that one no it, it's it's a famous one like it's been in movies and, and i go that's bullshit fear is not a choice nobody chooses fear you don't ever go you know it's monday i've had three good days i hope something catastrophic happens today so i can practice my resiliency like nobody wants fear so when it happens it's either an immediate physiological response to a perceived threat or it's an imagined response to a perceived threat either way you get the adrenaline you get the cortisol you get all the, the negative shit it's the self-awareness piece that goes wait a minute i just went from parasympathetic to sympathetic to be to sound fancy yeah like why am i breathing differently why do i have butterflies why am i sweating and if you can recognize that it's no different than a pre-contact cue in a violent encounter if i can start moving and this actually helps people uh, uh control anxiety i mean you know my favorite acronym for fear false expectations appearing real i'm visualizing something in the future that's immobilizing me in the present yeah. but anyways i started the i started the whole podcast over you asked me where can people reach me <laughs> yeah. get the making friends with fear if you can afford it and you can you can almost not afford to get it get the no fear digital um We've started doing a lot more stuff with, with families, with corporations, with, and I love the fear stuff. And I'll tell you this, you know, and this is an observation I made in the 80s during our, we were doing Fight Club before Fight Club was a movie, uh, you know, with gear on. That was the only difference. The people who manage their fear manage to fight. The people who manage their fear manage to fight. That means you're in the fight. That means that win or lose, you have less emotional duress because you were in the fight. Mm -hmm. You didn't roll over. You didn't give up. You didn't turn a blind eye. You didn't cower. You didn't hide. You got in the fight. And so win or lose, uh, dignity, pride, and resilience. You go, I went through that. It sucked. But now I know a little bit more about that. So I would tell people to do that. If you're I'm hoping that you've got a lot of law enforcement, public safety people that follow you. Yeah, I do. You know, reach out, give us a shot. We have a, uh, we've got some online free courses for public safety that can kind of get you into the system. But it's, uh, you know, like like you tried to bring out in in this talk, it's way different than like just another tool in the toolbox. Yeah. You know, it's it's a it's a holistic approach to personal safety, and and. You know, every every human, every good human should know be, how to protect themselves because violence loves speed. And when it happens, you don't have time to fucking YouTube what to do. Like you're the first responder in your fight. And so as a first responder, if you're getting ambushed, who are you calling? Right. You're the fir you're a first responder. You need to be the first responder in your fight. And cops get sucker punched and guns grabbed and shit all the time. So that whole airbag element and there's more to the system, but that could that could really buy people time and, and help them. Yeah. Amazing, man. Thanks for being on the show. I appreciate you. Buddy, thank you.